which is very, very cool. Um, for those of you that have not been here before, this is going to be a regular every Saturday thing. Um, and I want it to be as valuable to all of you as possible. So if there are things that you're wanting to talk about, learn about, then um, there is a suggestion box in the Wellness Center. I was going to bring it down. I forgot to bring it down here. But if you want, just uh, let me know. You can directly tell me what you want uh, the topics to be, or you can leave them in those uh, suggestion boxes. Um, this one is just one that kind of came up. I didn't have any suggestions this week, and it's one that uh, there are always lots of questions about. And so I've got four or five things that I want to talk about, but ultimately I want to open it up for some questions and answers because there are a lot of misconceptions and uh, misunderstandings about the roles of exercise and nutrition and how they interact with our bodies and our physiology. So, um, yeah, we'll just uh, jump right into it. But uh, keep in mind that there will be time to ask questions toward the end. Um, and if there's something that I don't talk about, I, I definitely want to acknowledge one of those things because hopefully. When you saw this, if you saw it on K4, I, I sent out a message yesterday of what the topic was going to be. Um, and if that's what brought you here, hopefully in your head you thought, oh, I hope he talks about A, B, or C. And we can, we can dive into some of that stuff. Some of it's specific to age, and some of it isn't. But uh, this is one that we hear a lot. You know, it's that old idea, you can't teach an old drug, uh, dog new tricks. Right? Or in other words, I'm too old to start something new. This is something we hear on a regular basis at Ovation. We'll you know, have new residents move in, and when me or one of the other members of the wellness team talk to those new members, we hear a lot of times people say things like, oh, I've never done any of that my whole life. Why am I going to start now? What would be the benefit to starting now this late in life? I'm, oh, I'm, I'm kind of in my ways and I don't want to start anything new. But uh, first of all, before we talk about some of the research, what would your perception or what would your answer be to that? Do you agree or disagree that uh, we are too old to start something new? Well, I've had my grandkids talk me into doing things that I didn't think I'd ever do, like Absolutely. a zip line and, and uh, uh, what is it when you go up on a, up on a boat, I forget what you call it. Go so up on a boat? Well, you're on a boat, but then they get Oh, parasailing. Yeah, parasailing, yeah. That's cool. Uh, yeah. So Very cool. I think a person can if they want to. Absolutely. I think it's a want to thing. Did those experiences add any value to you or your life? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I could say I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I could say I did. You think it depends on the interest level more than your Absolutely. If you're really interested in doing it, you do it and enjoy it. And I think that that's, that's, a, that's an interesting key. You know, we hear a lot of people say that I'm too old to start something new. In regard to exercise, it's because we have an outcome associated with that. We think we are exercising for a purpose instead of just using our bodies to be active and live a more full life. So absolutely, motivation is, is a, you know, why we're doing it has a lot to say with if, how mo motivated we are going to be to, to implement something new. But uh, a lot of the research shows that the opposite is true of that statement, that the more active um, we are, the, uh, or, or sorry, the, the less active we are, the higher the risk is for um, all of those age-related conditions that we typically associate with. Um, so not only is the importance of ac activity much greater, but the risk of inactivity increases with age. So that's the first thing, we, regardless of when we implement a system of movement, and I like that better than saying exercise. I don't like the word exercise because it connotes an outcome. 
right? And uh, people will ask me, well, what do you do for exercise? And my answer as a person that's worked in the exercise and fitness industry for 20 years is that I don't exercise. I don't believe in exercising because then I'm doing it for an outcome. I'm doing it for something outside of myself. So it doesn't mean I'm not active. It doesn't mean I don't move my body, but I don't look at it in terms of the outcome. Well, we know that inactive people are more than twice as likely to develop heart disease and diabetes later in life. Um, they are prescribed more medications and have more doctor visits. Across the board, almost twice as likely. That's a pretty significant number. If nothing else, who wouldn't want to decrease half of the amount of meds that they are taking or half of the trips to the doctor's office, um, decrease the risk of those those medical conditions by half. So that across the board inactivity increases by more than double. The second one is we know that activity regardless of when it's being adopted into life significantly decreases our risk of falls. It increases mental health and cognitive function and provides a lot of avenues for social engagement. And a lot of uh, these these others are typically ones that we traditionally don't associate with exercise or activity. You know, specifically to our society and you know Western culture, we look at systems of diet and exercise to have to do with just our body weight, because we've been told our whole lives that weight equals health, and that's how we're going to measure our health. And so we don't think about things like our fall risk and we don't think about cognitive function but just you know those of you that have all been to classes that we teach here as much of it is you know stimulating muscles a lot of it is things like the mental health and cognitive function we do different time interval patterns um, that cause focus and attention we do walking patterns or or motor skills that we might not be used to doing. So, you know, those things happen even without us knowing uh, about it a lot of times. And then also providing avenues for social engagement. Um, there have been times in my life where my social environment has been primarily the people that I was working with in gyms. Um, and I've noticed that in the people that come to specific classes, you know, we, those of you that come to specific classes here at Ovation, you know likely who you're gonna see in those same classes, right? We have the same schedules, and so when we do those things together, those are new avenues for social engagement. And so everything in science and research and experience points the opposite of that statement is true, that, that there is benefit to starting a system of movement any time in life, um, especially if we go back to what we've talked about previously in the last couple of weeks, you know, looking at the intention and identifying that a lot of times we're very black and white in our thinking about exercise. And we think, okay, well, if I can't get to the gym for this specific class, then it just doesn't make sense for me and I'm not gonna move at all today. And we think in, in very, finite and uh, quantitative terms, but really every step that we take is making us more fit. Every time we take the stairs instead of the elevator or that extra step, that extra repetition of exercise, all of that compounds and moves us closer. It's not that we have to hit a certain quota of movement before we start to, to enjoy those benefits. So that's the first one. Second one is that I hear a lot is I'm not, I can't exercise or I can't lift weights because it's dangerous. I'm going to get hurt. This is one that I've heard with um, over um, lots and lots of years. But uh, just like previous statement, we know the research shows that the more fit and active the individual, the less likely they are to sustain an injury and the less likely they are to get hurt in a sustained injury. Um, so a lot of times we just think about it in terms of the injury itself or the accident itself and not how our body responds to that. But there is a lot of difference. You know, um, if any of you have ever experienced a fall, 
prior to that fall, depending on the level of fitness, that has a direct correlation on how your body responds, how fast you recover. You know, those that are more fit and active are able to bounce back from an accident and injury faster than those that aren't. So that's the first thing we want to look at. But then um, the way that we make sure that this doesn't apply, um, because we know that strength training is one of the best ways to, to increase stability as well as decrease um, some of the things associated with um, arthritis and osteoporosis. You know, we have a lot of joint concerns and we think, oh, if I put more pressure on the muscles, that's going to increase the pressure on the joints and it's going to exacerbate those problems. But it's actually the opposite that's true. The more active we are, the more we strength train, the more benefit we have, and the more we avoid some of those things. But we do need to know our limits. But I put and in capitals right here because we want to know our limits but also want to trust those that are professionals in the field. Because if our experience doesn't allow us, if we've never really pushed ourselves to the point that we can do something, we might believe that our limits are much lower than what they are. We might be able to believe that we can't do something when in all reality we can. And that's one of the most gratifying things for me and Kesley to, to witness in classes is when we see people make those improvements and say, wow, I can, I can sit up from a lower starting point now, or I can lift the eight pound dumbbells instead of the six pound dumbbells, or I graduated from the blue band up to the purple band. Those things are, are huge um, motivating, but uh, it allows us to, be, to trust those of us in, in uh, professional positions to help figure out what the limits are. Um, but I do want to talk about this one a lot. The second part is after we know our limits, after we trust those that we're working with, not comparing ourselves. Because this is a huge piece. When we look at the culture of exercise in, that we kind of go to, the outcome focused approach of why we're moving, we are constantly comparing ourselves to other people. And even in classes, we're looking at how other people are lifting and we're looking at how much weight they're doing and we're thinking, oh, I wish I could lift that much or we envy that or we maybe push ourselves more than we should. Um, because society has, has dictated a comparison metric. But in reality, every single person is a unique biological individual and we're all going to respond a little bit differently to different diets and different systems of exercise and so we don't want to get stuck in the rut of comparing ourselves to anyone other than ourselves um, where we were at previously yesterday so not comparing ourselves to others and then taking any precautions and using preventative measures to allow the safety and security of an exercise program and so just because we're starting doesn't mean that we're going to eliminate all of those precautions we might have. If we have a walker, then we want to maintain using a walker until we feel like we can graduate from that and feel just as safe without it as we do. So it's not forcing a feeling of unsafety or, or not feeling security, but it's increasing balance and core strength and stability and all of these things up so that we can get rid of those things um, and that's our goal here at Ovation, is that when people come here, that's why we do the, the virtual, or not the virtual, but the, the conversation inventories, the oral inventory, where we're kind of asking basic questions um, about where you're at, and then we also, with Mareka, will do the, you know, the little speed test, how much distance we can cover in five minutes, or the balance test, some things like that, and use those as benchmarks to improve from, so that when we have you in classes, all of our goals in those classes are individual to each person and they're geared toward your bigger picture in terms of uh, rehabilitation and, and uh, muscle balancing and those types of things. So we should not be comparing ourselves to that young lady lifting 400 pounds. Yeah, and well, yeah, absolutely. I put this up here just because one of the, I used to teach um, and coach at a CrossFit gym for a few years. That was primarily what I did. And CrossFit as a, as a training modality is marketed toward younger, 
former high school and collegiate athletes that still have a competitive fire that want to push themselves in kind of these extreme levels. And if it's not coached properly, it can be dangerous. But that's regardless of any age. But um, there were, this, this specific woman became really popular because you don't see a lot of senior citizens deadlifting. Um, and so this, this picture became viral during CrossFit. Um, but yeah, she didn't start by deadlifting that much weight. Um, and there's a secret. These are what we call bumper plates. They're high density rubber, not steel plates. And so in reality, that's, let's see, 95, that's probably about 130 pounds, what looks like 45 pound plate. But I don't wanna take anything away from her. She's doing awesome. Um, and then we hear this one a lot too, is that we're worried, especially in the uh, circumstances where there might be pre-existing conditions like heart disease or family history of heart problem. We don't wanna push ourselves to a certain level because we're worried that our heart is not strong enough to maintain that level anymore. Um, but similar to previous research, consistent activity increased heart rate at any age significantly decreases the risks associated with all of the cardiovascular system. So not only heart disease and heart attack, stroke risk, but also um, decreasing cholesterol, decreasing high blood pressure, all of those types of things. Um, because strengthening the heart is a consistent goal throughout life. And sometimes we just we kind of reserve ourselves to this idea that, oh yeah, my heart's capacity decreases as I get older, and that's true. You know, we lose um, aerobic capacity about one beat per minute for every year of life on general scale. And so our, our capacity decreases biologically. Same thing with our strength. Our ability to produce force decreases with age. As we get older, as, as our hormones change, our capacity decreases. But that doesn't mean that we don't continue to just try to strengthen to that capacity because even though our capacity is decreasing, no one in the world is at their capacity. I would say that every single person in the world can improve their current position. There's no benchmark that we've made it and even if we have, it's not guaranteed. It is a lifelong pursuit to maintain heart health. And so we wanna target elevated heart rate consistently on a regular basis. Um, I put these two pictures up there direct to the heart because a lot of people are worried about things like exercise overstimulating the heart. Um, but jumping out of airplanes and the adrenaline involved there is gonna have a little bit more of a heart impact and. Uh, and it's not nearly as cause of alarm. And I would say that the risk of inactivity and the um, allowing the heart to decrease its function, um, not proactively moving forward, is gonna be more harmful to the heart than potentially doing something that we're worried about overstimulating um, the heart. And then lastly, we hear that our body doesn't move like we used to. Um, and this is true. This is absolutely true. But the one thing that we have to consider is that our bodies are dynamic. And just because our bodies don't move like they maybe used to be able to doesn't mean that they potentially cannot. We know that the less we move, the less our body is able to move. And I know that sounds like a kind of an obvious statement. Our capacity to move our joints to their full range of motion is directly correlative to us using our joints in those ranges of motion. So as we slow down moving, it gets harder to move. That's it's hard. I mean, that's as significant as it is. And we see this progress from a person that's very mobile and athletic upright, um, and maybe, because an injury or a fall has to start using a walker, right? When we first start using a walker, we're more upright. They're, they're designed to maintain that upright posture. But with an injury, we're gonna start spending more time sitting down. And the more time we spend sitting down, the more those hip flexors start to close. 
right? And they get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And pretty soon, that person that was walking nice and upright without the assistance of a walker is using a walker. And now the hips are so locked into place that we can't even stand upright. Now, it wasn't because the joints themselves all of a sudden fused and became connected or cemented together. It's that the muscles got so tight that now the joints can't open that whole way, right? It's like the parking brake in our car. When the parking brake is on, it doesn't mean that the car can't drive anymore, but the tightness of the brakes are preventing it to function. And that's the way that we look at mobility or the flexibility. And so the more we can move our body through the wider range of motion, the better off we are going to be across all boards. Um, and that's kind of the concept or the idea that I want to, to end with is that because our um, drive for fitness has been so outcome focused, because we're focusing on the results, uh, there's been a big push to focus on our cardio as our foundation and then strength training. But very, very infrequently do we hear about flexibility and mobility. Flexibility is just your body's ability to move a joint through its full range of motion, and mobility is the functional application of that range of motion. So it's one thing for me to be able to, um, if I'm laying on my back, be able to pull my knee up in the direction of my shoulder and stretch out my leg. So that would be flexibility. Mobility would be able to have that same range of motion if I'm upright. So I've got to have balance, the coordination, to have that same range of motion. So that would be mobility. Um, and there hasn't been a big focus on flexibility and mobility because we've been so driven to think that cardio and burning calories and losing weight and strength training for muscles is the most important thing. But my contention, or my argument, would be that flexibility is the foundation. And I say that for a few reasons. Um, most importantly, we know that if we have good flexibility, if we can move our body through its full range of motion without pain and without injury, that's going to enhance what I can do with my body. So I'll get more out of my cardio and more out of my strength. I'll be able to go farther distance or lift more weight or whatever. If I've got limitations to my flexibility or mobility, if I have a harder time moving my body, that limits what I can do for my cardio and what I can do for my strength. And so if I had to choose, people ask me all the time, well, what's most important, strength or cardio? And I always tell them, neither one of those, start with the foundation of flexibility. Once the body can move freely without pain, then we'll start stimulating with, with strength and we'll start stimulating with some cardio stuff to build on from there. But uh, we need to start with the foundation of flexibility. If there's one thing that you could do each day, every day, it's stretch. Stretch your joints as much as you can um, in bed if you want, before you even get out of bed, before you go to sleep at night. Um, maybe that's one of the things that we'll do uh, on one of these in the future is doing a kind of a daily stretch routine that you can do just in your, in your residence room targeting the major um, joints of the major muscles. But anyway, those are some of the most common myths that we run into in regard to aging as they relate to our, our exercise habits and wellness. But I'd love to open it up for any comments that you might have, any questions in regard to this or anything else that you were hoping to hear from that you didn't. Go ahead, Russ. Um, just from my own experience only being here, we're in our third week, but um, I agree with everything you're saying there, but I would put more emphasis on the, uh, the societal engagement. For me and my wife, it has uh, you know, not have to, have to do with how many laps we take and things like that, but engaging with other people. Absolutely. That is that has just as much importance as any of these other things. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. That was one of the the things that, you know, we um, 
in, in a previous job, before I came here, I was the uh, fitness manager at a, a weight loss wellness uh, program. People would come from a, for a week at a time, but some of them would stay for months at a time to get their health in check and, and kind of get their bodies right. And part of the message that I shared there is some research that actually shows that exercise itself, caloric burn and output has very, very little to do with weight loss and very little to do with body composition management. It's almost completely nutrition. And so a lot of the guests that were there to lose weight would say, wait a second, if exercise isn't the big piece of the equation, why are we moving our bodies six or seven hours a day in all of these classes? And the answer is exactly what you just said. It's because of the camaraderie and the connection to human beings. When we do things that are uh, together, it fosters connection with ourselves and with other people. And then when you add something challenging on top of that, when two people are both doing something physically challenging, it solidifies and strengthens that bond even greater. And so I think that there's no better, better way to build those connections with the other residents um, here than doing it in things like the, the fitness or wellness classes or those activities that include some type of challenge that we're not used to. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, that's also good for the body, brain. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, the, the physical interaction, the conversation, very good for the for cognitive function. What else? Any other questions? It was great just that we come from getting together on a nice Saturday morning and having biscuits and gravy. And <laughs> a very healthy breakfast. Yes, uh -huh. That's all right. You gotta, you gotta weigh the options. You gotta take the benefit of getting together and the social facilitation and make a smile and say it's okay that we're eating gravy for breakfast today because I'm happy. Uh, you put a little emphasis on gravy. That's all right. Well, great. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for coming. Like I said, if you have suggestions or if you have ideas or concepts or classes that you would like to have, if you want um, exercise programming or diet planning, something like that, stress management, breath work, anything, let me know um, and I'd be happy to, to put some stuff together for you. All right, have a good day. Have a good rest of the week. <laughs>